just an acumen, a case study. Uh, read you the bio and then we'll talk a little bit about our friendship with uh, Kentucky over recent years. Caesar has 21 years of experience in the oil and gas industry, 16 years of experience in project control. He began in construction and worked in engineering and front-end engineering. While he has experience in estimating, cost control, procurement, risk analysis, progress management, and more, he has spent the last 10 years honing his experience, expertise in earned value and planning and scheduling. Um, in the last two years for asking me at Acumen, Getting in the, some more licensing and getting things going. Good discounts. Good discounts, exactly. <laughs> so we've, um, so I, I guess what, a year and a half ago, you and I started talking a little bit. Caesar and I kind of both inherited this world a little bit. Uh, Caesar, in your role, you inherited Fuse. I think you had a, maybe a few licenses. Uh, yeah, that's one. Yeah. And uh, one of my earliest calls to, to Caesar, again, about a year and a half ago, was not so pleasant because uh, they, they had uh, put some license in place, but there hadn't been a whole lot of training and there hadn't been a whole lot of heads up to the field and the project team. But he was getting a lot of uh, flack back from the, uh, the fields in terms of what, what this fuse analysis meant, where was it coming from, what are these metrics and baseline. So uh, we, were, we had to kind of reset at the time and sit down and, and, and talk about uh, how we wanted to move forward from that point uh, with tech. Uh, obviously that involved some training on the front end, both with views as well as going down the road with risk and, and kind of some workshops. I think Dan and I came down on at least one or a couple of occasions uh, face to face on site with the technique teams. And then ever since then, things have really gone much smoother. Um, not only have we expanded here in Houston uh, with Caesar's team, uh, with both views and risk. I'm at 360, are you guys working on 360? Uh, yeah. You got all this one. Okay. Yeah, two and then also in three, 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 three. Okay. And then in Paris, uh, corporate, they recently um, stood up a significant uh, footprint of uh, all the above. So, that being said, let me go ahead and introduce Cesar Ramos to Techie. Bear with me, I'm not much of a public speaker, so I'll try. Uh, like, uh, Jason said, when we started in the beginning, we were trying to, you know, we would we would uh, audit our schedules in specific ways. So <clears throat> we use we ended up using cues, but we got a lot of uh, agreement <coughs> over the metrics. And come to find out that we were trying to the trouble we had was was having. You know, the metrics come out in, in a standard format. So we kind of had to bring out Jason and Dan and, and try and introduce it to the team and explain the, uh, the, uh, the metrics and how they work. So get a lot of familiarity with the tools. It was kind of a shock factor, right? Um, we fused it, there was a score, everybody panicked and then <laughs> went from there. <laughs> what does that mean? What does that mean? You know, they argue. So <clears throat> appreciate the help. But since then we we uh this one. Oh, I guess before we begin. Uh, we're gonna do the uh, presenter's intro and be Pat is actually gonna help me with some of this because this case study uh, is an event that happened in the sub area, and he's going to help me explain it. <clears throat> and then we're going to do technique at a glance, try and uh, provide technique, you know, give everybody an overview, and then present the case study. So again, I think my introduction is there, uh, subject matter expert for North America. <clears throat> in terms of planning and scheduling and earned value, physical progress. I also hold a dual role as the Technique North American Onshore Business Unit Leader. Uh, my experience is mainly construction, engineering for the past six years, and I worked in the offshore environment for the past two years, but now I'm back to the onshore, and uh, worked a little bit in the subsea arena. That being said, I'll, I'm going to start to introduce Pat, 
uh, and then Pat can provide his uh, self intro there. Okay. Pat Smith. Uh, my name is Pat Smith. Uh, as it says up here, I'm the Technique North America P6 Administrator. I'm um, also the Subsea Business Unit Lead. Um, so I'm going to help Caesar a little bit on here and uh, explain a little bit about Subsea, unless there's a lot of Subsea people in here. I know there's a couple of them. Uh, I'll just give a little background. Um, for Subsea, what we, we can we do uh, provide services, Subsea field development, uh, rigid and uh, flexible pipelines, uh, umbilicals, Subsea maintenance, and uh, flexible drilling services. <coughs> So technique at a glance. Um, it's a global company. It's a French-owned. Our corporate office is in Paris. Uh, we have offices worldwide. We have over uh, 38,000 people in 48 countries. Um, we we go from the subsea oil and gas. It's, it's mainly our 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 focus. Uh, let's see what else is pertinent. You know, we're publicly trading, uh, New York Stock Exchange, Paris Exchange, and others. The, uh, like Pat mentioned, we have 28 vessels of fleet in operation, and eight more in construction. Operating income uh, from reoccurring activities, 821.7 euros, million euros, and revenue for 2012 was uh, 8.2 billion. So we actually do a lot of the engineering, but in the U.S., we haven't done that much construction, so we partner typically with KBR or Zachary or Floor and the onshore arena. Uh, we do have a fabrication yard in Finland where we do the spar fabrications, uh, TOPs, but we also do consortiums. Uh, with HHI and, and others. Uh, the next slide. So, technique and acumen history. Um, 2009, we, well, it was really 2010, wasn't it? 2010. Uh, we had a subject matter expert that, it, that was in our office 2010. He obtained a license to fuse early 2010 when it first came out. He was actually, I think, trained by Dan and Risk. That's how he initiated the conversation and in late 2010 is when we were trying to implement the Acumen Fuse uh, software. So we were tasked by our management to try and establish a, a means of objectively analyzing and, and Acumen all the metrics. Are, for me, they're, they're, they're spot on because it limits the subjectivity and the opinion of a peer uh, providing their input where we have at least a standard there to discuss on right? So we officially incorporated uh, the schedule in our schedule review procedure, uh, actually, the results. So we have a, a two-fold analysis when we do schedule reviews. We have to comply with our standards, which means our en engineering standards and, and um, you know, all other governing standards, depending where we're working. We have to comply with what we call a green book, which is our planning standards. It's typically industry best practices. And then we couple that with the fuse uh, results, which has some metrics, and then we discuss all of the above. All of this is, is in turn to try and get it uh, compliant, right? So uh, we require the, the full suites here in the US. So we, we bought five licenses for North America. However, in Brazil, we had a technique conference, planning conference in Brazil. It was in April. And during this conference, I had a new topic was acumen, and I did a live demonstration and all this good stuff. And basically, used two tactics against my corporate fellows was scare tactic that the clients are all buying acumen and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a good time. And then you know when they seen a live demonstration, they see how how simple you can you know maneuver through the software and get immediate results. 
So they, they piqued an immediate interest, and then shortly thereafter, I think, uh, between Jason and, and Phil, over in, in the, the other side of the world, they acquired over 25 licenses, or in the process of, I think they should have something. So I think, Phil, I don't know if you want to say anything on that. Any involvement <laughs> with our corporate friends over there? They do things different in Europe. So I think that's been our discussions, right? Uh, so I guess you can go to the next slide. Yeah, hang on. Okay. So we were going to go straight into the, the nuts and bolts of the conversation here and talk about our analysis and then kind of what we found and then and things of that nature. But you know, a couple days ago, I told Pat, well, maybe it helps if you give them a visual of, of the work, the subsea work, how it works. So that way you have a, a frame of uh, reference, uh, a visual reference to, uh, to the criteria. Yeah, that. Uh, so like I said, my name is Pat Smith. Uh, we'll give a little update on the scope of work and some of the equipment that, that we really focused on uh, in this uh, analysis. Um, so like I said, we'll go with the scope of work, kind of a high level. Uh, I'm going to describe to you what plets are. Some of you may not know, some of you may know. Uh, I'm going to describe, uh, hone in on our client review cycles, which was our, one of the main uh, subjects here, and then talk a little bit about the schedule the developer schedule itself. Um, so this is our overall scope of work on the cartoon, kind of showing the, uh, the field layout. Um, plets are what's called out and what I'm going to talk about. First, I'll talk about the, we had eight rigid flow lines. Oh, thank you. We had uh, eight rigid flow lines, uh, three lazy wave risers, um, three flex joints on the end of those lazy wave risers, three large manifolds here. Um, we had 13 plets. So plets are pipeline end terminations. They go basically on the end of your rigid uh, pipeline welded. Um, we had six sleepers, uh, which are basically a big sawhorse that the pipeline can sit on. Concrete mattresses, uh, 24 flexible jumpers, uh, four infill umbilicals, uh, two dynamic umbilical risers, uh, 98 flying leads, and then we did the pre-commissioning pre on the project as well. And the red font, uh, just so you know, the red font indicates the client free issue material. So again, I'm gonna uh, kind of go in a little more detail about the, about the plets, because that's what's gonna end up, you'll see the relevance later on when we get into the analysis. Um, all right. So plets, like I said, they're pipeline end termination unit. Uh, basically, a, a big valve assembly that you put on the end of your rigid pipeline. Um, this is one basically in the horizontal position. Uh, here's the bottom. I've got a cup piece pipeline that it's welded to. And then in this case, you have a three valve setup, three hubs. Um, in the second picture here, this is actually one from the project in the inverted position. So this is in the position ready for uh, <coughs> termination to the pipe. You see the pipe, pipe cup in, same here, uh, in the vertical position, pipeline coming from overhead. So they're basically setting up here to, to do the weld. And as you can see, we had a lot of observers, obviously, on this. A lot of, uh, a lot of things going on in this position here, a lot of setup, a lot of rigging. Um, so that kind of gives you a basic idea of, of what we're going to talk about. And then um, the client review cycles. Um, so per our contract, uh, we, had, we had set up a 10-day uh, review cycle where after we would issue a document or procedure, to our client, they had 10 days to review that and return it and for our first round of review. So that was from essentially a Rev B document coming back for us to start work up to a Rev Zero. Um, so design reports for the plebs were one of the main players um, in our fabrication. Most, most of these uh, design reports were approved after the fabrication had started. So. Basically, we ended up seeing the delays that were coming, and we had to go ahead and take the risk upon ourselves to start the fabrication in this case. Um, some of the procurement that went on within the plets uh, were the bins, and the bins are a piece of 
forging that goes into the plant uh, kit itself. Um, we, in this case, we used a preferred vendor, so a vendor that the client said, these guys are approved, all the well procedures are great, go for it, here you go. Um, all the documentation approved four months after issue. So you see that you see well, there's an ongoing theme here. Um, of course, this led on to a knock-on effect to the fabrication of the plebs. Um, and then the general procurement of the steel uh, for the building of the pleb, uh, frame, uh, same, same story here. Nearly wherever well documented took greater than a two-week turnaround that was agreed upon and baseline in the schedule. Uh, client requested them to approve every material takeoff for every piece of steel, which turned into 56 separate documents by itself. Um, you'll, see, you'll see the thing that did happen though is the plant fabricator, when they did start welding, uh, well, there was a delay in the PO as well because of all the, the pending due and you see in the above. But we finally awarded in January, but they didn't start welding until May. Once they got going though, the fabricator was able to, to complete nine of the plets in less than four months. And they fabricated the final four plets in two months. So once they got going and everything was approved, fabrication went fairly quickly, which you see would have would have helped us in the, in the execution of the project. So, and this is just one, but this was a common common theme for every, almost everything we had fabricated. Um, in the schedule development, uh, typical for for most of our schedules, we usually do a, a three activity set for per deliverable. So what I've done here is I've, I've grouped out the, the plets. Um, and you see that there's that 10 day agreed upon review cycle uh, baseline. Um, with, the, with the granularity of the, of the scheduled development, we were able to then, it, it did improve our, our precise analysis with that, uh, then bringing it into acumen. Of course, some of the cons there uh, were obviously this became about an 1800 activity schedule. So it's quite cumbersome to manage at, at times, especially in the middle of, uh, middle of development. Um, but once it was agreed upon, it was off and running, and these, you'll see how these 10-day activities, as small as they appear here, they became very, very large and impacted. Right, right there, there, let me, I want to point out that those three bars represent a milestone chain in the rules of credit. The reason for this is that what's not shown is the budgets, and in the subsea environment, they're actually doing earned value in the schedule. So we're taking and budget loading every activity, uh, representing the weighted value for each milestone, and then we're progressing each activity as, as they get completed. That yields an earned value, and that earned value gets rolled up, and then we put in our expended uh, quantities, and out of P6, we can actually do the, the uh, earned value analysis as SPI, CPI, EAC, the whole uh, environment. So that's why the previous presentation we were in for earned value, uh, we've, we've kind of gotten away from producing this much detail in the schedule because of uh, the, the amount of growth, you know, just to represent a milestone change. Uh, so, for example, how many deliverables did you have uh, here? Uh, we had about uh, well, the fabrication deliverables? Or the whole bit? Uh, it was, yeah. Probably about 7,700 yeah. activities yeah. or something. Yeah. It can, it can grow pretty large pretty fast. And uh, we, we internally technique have our own progress measurement system. And that's what we use for our value. So we can scale back the degree of uh, granularity out of the schedule to comply with what we call standards and it's usually, you know, sufficient decomposition to perform, you know, critical fact analysis, right? So there's that methodology twist. Oh, you can go to the next one. So then, going back to the the analysis, uh, I want to point out that this analysis, uh, Pat and uh, John contacted me by then. 
things that were not considered critical because they had a lot of flow, such as the plants, had gone so far to the right that it was it was completely obvious that you know this was pushing out the vessels and everything else. Uh, so by the time we did this analysis, this is a lot of this was kind of after the fact fact-finding mission, uh, and some of this in, in the realm of it was to prepare a change order or claim for the client to show them that their delays in the review cycles impacted us in a way that, you know, we needed to substantiate a, you know, some type of agreement or, you know, change. And then just to point out, <clears throat> I put in parentheses two hours and 20 minutes, because once we open this up, I'll describe how it all went, but in reality, this, this whole analysis uh, was fairly quick. Uh, the conversation, though, between us and the client, therefore, I think it's still ongoing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> we pat ourselves in the back and they're like, here you go, <laughs> go forth and try and save the world. Okay, so <clears throat> the full EPC contract was awarded. And as the project progressed, delays started occurring in the project, delaying engineer, engineering deliverables and began to impact the offshore mobilization, which was the vessel uh, campaign and critical equipment delivery. Okay, these, these delays required some forensics uh, and possible impacts to the delays. The initial uh, analysis believed that the client had impacted these delays. I think we were, we're about to go in the detail. And of course, after you'll see, the, the evidence is pretty clear. And I think the rest are already said. So the first initial attempt was to review the depletion of flow that was caused by the client. Right, that's what we're at. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once the need was recognized, uh, a small, small peer group, which was me, Pat, and John. On the way. Uh, we're trying to explore the limitations of acumen. And we're gathering all the files and we're, you know, we're gathering the business units to compare all the files. And I remember at the time we had version 3. Point whatever it was. And we couldn't figure out, and I, and I remember Dan said it this morning, is prior to the trend analyzer, somebody's going to say, why don't you use trend analyzer? It didn't exist. Um, so we were trying to figure out because it compares in a vertical fashion as opposed to horizontal. So we called, I remember that day, we were arguing about how to make it work, and we called Jason, and Jason, I know this works, can you make it work, what happened, and you know, when he calls his tech, and then we got this guy, and he, we kind of came to the conclusion that right now, you know, that's still in development. I said, okay, <laughs> okay, so, but that's okay because Somehow we had a consensus and, and we loaded all the snapshots in, in and uh, we bypassed the trend analyzer by using the ribbon itself. And I'll show you that in a minute. So I think Acumen recommended using Excel, which was I agree with, but Sub C wanted to. I'm not going to blame you for that, but these guys really wanted the tool to push uh, the, the effort, right? The business unit. The business unit. They had invested the money, so they wanted, right, so they wanted to prove that the tool could push forward. So the good thing is, Pat saved all the monthly updates. And that's just our protocol procedure. Every update, we save a snapshot or a baseline, or we XDR it out. Uh, so then we figured, OK, let's snap it in as snapshots. Uh, you know, below you see the, the ribbon analyzer, we'll go into a bigger uh, view, is how we did a, the initial ribbon analyzer. So the concept of loading schedule as a snapshot seemed to be the feasible solution. And uh, we renamed every file as a timestamp. So obviously, you know, January, February, March. This would emulate a graph. We loaded 14 XCRs. Uh, it, it, it acted as a timestamp. Then, uh, then we started producing the comparisons. Okay, and so for my bottom 
note there is uh, for the future, if you're ever going to use this, even now that we have the trend analyzer, because it works exactly the same, it's recommended you have update every uh, periodic update, monthly, weekly, bi-weekly. And you can yield the same type of results. Uh, also, you, I'll show you in a minute the, uh, the comparison of schedule variance, right? All the, the earned value metrics that can come out of the software. So phase one was the, uh, the critical flow. So we were looking for trends, we were looking for anything as, as immediate indicators to prove uh, depletion of flow and behavior. <clears throat> you can see that the selected criteria in the yellow up there to the left is critical. So our first plan of attack is to look at the critical items and you can see the behavior. Feel free to jump in Pat, whenever you want, but this, this starts to tell the story of how and we'll show you the later slide where the delays it actually started in this time frame that were expected to be completed and the downfall effects started impacting where you know we see this bump in, in uh, criticality because of you know criticalized. But then you see the release.